All right, class. So welcome. Here we are in chapter 12. We talked about blood the last time, and now we're getting into the heart. So we're kind of easing our way into the cardiovascular system. First, we talked about blood, what makes up blood, and now we will go into the structures of the cardiovascular system. And this whole chapter is just on the heart because the heart is the kind of the main pump or center of your cardiovascular system. And then next week, we will get into the different blood vessels, arteries, and veins, which make up your cardiovascular system. Um, from today on, we should be all caught up if you guys are following the syllabus and checking dates of exams. But after today, um, we should be caught up, even maybe ahead, depending on how far we get through with this lecture. So your cardiovascular system um, involves your heart and then all the blood vessels and blood. And the heart itself is the big muscular organ. So it's made up of cardiac muscle tissue and it's essential for life because it pumps blood throughout the body. And as you know from last time, blood is what carries all of our oxygen, nutrients, gets rid of waste products. So without our heart pumping this blood to get all of the gases and nutrients to all parts of the body, we wouldn't make it very long. So when your heart stops beating, um, death soon follows. The heart is a member of the cardiovascular system, and that includes the heart, blood vessels, arteries, and veins, and blood. And in a healthy adult, at rest, your heart pumps about five liters of blood per minute, which is a lot of blood if you think about one of those soda liter bottles, about five of those uh, of blood per, per minute. And the heart continues to pump at approximately that rate for about 75 years. So when you're about 75, or between 70 and 80, your heart can slow down a little bit, um, depending on how well you take care of yourself. It might slow down a little before then too. So here's your cardiovascular system. We have the heart right in the center. That's the big muscular pump. And then we have this kind of highway system of blood vessels or tubes that carry blood to all parts of the body. And red is referring to all of the arteries which are carrying blood away from the heart. Um, not always, but most of the time, your arteries are carrying oxygenated blood away from the heart. And then the veins are draining the deoxygenated blood from all the parts of the body um, to, to be taken back to the heart. So that's kind of how blood gets circulated through the body. And we'll talk more about that as we keep going. Um, so we talked about your heart is the main member or organ of the cardiovascular system. Um, if you think of your heart, think about it as kind of two pumps. So it's made up of your heart is made up of two pumps kind of running at the same time, side by side with the right side of your heart. That right pump pumps blood to your lungs to pick up oxygen and then come back to the left side of the heart through all the vessels that are known um, in pulmonary circulation. The word pulmonary always has to do with heart. So the right side of the heart pumps blood to the lungs to pick up oxygen. And then it, that oxygenated blood comes back to the heart uh, through vessels to the left side of the heart. And we call that the pulmonary circulation. And then the left side of the heart, the left pump in your heart pumps oxygenated blood to all the tissues of the body and then back to the right side of the heart through the vessels of what we call systemic circulation. So those are kind of our two kind of circulation systems within your circulatory system. The heart is always at the center. What you see in blue is considered deoxygenated blood. So blood that doesn't have oxygen in it yet. And you can see here the right side of the heart, the right pump. And again, as you're looking at your heart, rights and lefts are always labeled for how it would sit in the person. So this person's right side of the heart is in blue. Um, that's the deoxygenated blood. And that pump will pump blood to the lungs where those blood vessels pick up oxygen, get rid of carbon dioxide as waste, and then that blood returns to the left side of the heart. The left side of the heart always contains oxygenated blood. And that pump will pump the oxygenated blood to all of your body's tissues. And that is called systemic circulation when it goes to all of your body's systems. So systemic circulation pumps oxygenated blood to the body and pulmonary circulation pumps um, the blood to the lungs to pick up oxygen. 
you'll see here that in systemic circulation, you know, we start with oxygenated arteries leaving the left side of the heart. Um, and then we'll talk about this next time, but the arteries eventually are connected to what we call tissue capillaries, which are very small blood vessels. And at this point, the blood unloads its oxygen into the tissues that need it, and it picks up carbon dioxide as waste. So that's why we see this color change going from red to blue, because at the capillary level, this is where we have all our gas exchange, where our nutrients get dumped off or waste products get picked up. So you'll notice here that this once red oxygenated blood, after it gets rid of its oxygen at the capillaries, will become blue to signify that it's not carrying oxygen anymore. So then those blue veins will kind of drain the blood back to the heart to take us back through our pumping system. And again, this is so important. We need the right side of the heart to pump blood to the lungs to pick up oxygen. And then we need the left side of the heart to pump that oxygenated blood to all the tissues of the body. These pumps happen at the same time. So with every kind of ejection of blood from these blood vessels, one goes to the lungs, one side goes to the lungs, and the other kind of the left side um, brings the blood to all your body's tissues. So there are functions of the heart. It also helps to generate blood pressure because your heart um, can pump at a faster rate. So it can, um, it can kind of change blood pressure, but it also just generates blood pressure because this ejection of blood out of your heart produces such a strong force of that the blood puts on the blood vessel walls. And that's what blood pressure is. It also routes the blood. So your heart um, ensures that there's a one way flow of blood. And we'll talk about how blood flows through your heart. Um, that's really important. We don't want blood going back into a chamber it shouldn't in your heart because this one way flow of blood makes your cardiovascular system very efficient. And when we're talking about, you know, getting oxygen to all of your body's tissues, this is a life or death situation. So we need to be as efficient as possible. And the heart makes sure that the blood only flows in one direction and it never goes backwards. Uh, your heart also regulates the blood supply because it can have, you could have a faster heart rate. Um, let's say when you're exercising, for example, your heartbeat increases to pump out blood faster. So it helps to regulate your blood supply. A little more about your heart. It's about the size of your fist. It weighs less than a pound and it's located between your lungs within your thoracic cavity. Um, just left to the sternum. So I'm just going to draw, you know, your sternum again is your breastbone, which you can feel going down your chest. And your heart just lies slightly left to that. Um, and it kind of points downwards at its apex. Um, you can also see here how the heart kind of is twisted, um, not twisted, but it kind of is turned on itself so that we, what we call the left ventricle, kind of the bottom left half of the heart is more on the front and it kind of sits back on itself. Um, so that are some, those are some heart characteristics. The pericardia, this refers to how your heart is enclosed in its own kind of sac of connective tissue. Um, and you'll notice here the, the stem root for heart will always have cardia in it. The pericardium is a double layered sac that anchors and protects the heart to surrounding tissues. And you can see that here, this is your pericardium. It's made up of two layers, the fibrous and serous pericardium. Um, the parietal, and we'll talk kind of, we'll focus on the serous pericardium because these two are described here. We have the parietal pericardium, which is the membrane around the heart's cavity itself. And then the visceral pericardium, visceral always refers to the organ or viscera. And this is the membrane on the heart's surface itself. And then the pericardial cavity is just a space um, around the heart and it's filled with pericardial fluid. So it's a little hard to see here. Um, I wish it would be zoomed in a little more. But the parietal pericardium lines kind of the, the pericardium, the sac that the heart is in, and the visceral pericardium lines the heart itself, the organ. And then between the two um, 
pericardiums, we have this cavity filled with fluid. And this cavity filled with fluid just acts as kind of an extra boundary or protective layer um, surrounding the heart. Some external heart anatomy, so what's going on on the outside of your heart, uh, a coronary sulcus extends around the heart, separating the atria from the ventricles. And the sulcus is kind of like a little depression or a division in heart tissue. There are two grooves or sulci, which indicate the division between the right and left ventricles. And I'll show you pictures of this. They extend kind of inferiorly or downward from the coronary sulcus. And the anterior interventricular sulcus extends inferiorly from the coronary sulcus on the anterior surface of the heart. So what we're describing here are kind of just little depressions within the heart wall tissues. And I'll show you a picture once we talk about um, them a little more. Then you have a sulcus on the posterior side of the heart um, that extends inferiorly from the coronary sulcus on the back side of the heart. You have a superior and an inferior vena cava that carry blood from the body and put it back into the right atrium. And then you have four pulmonary veins that carry blood from the lungs to the left atrium. You have two arteries, um, often called the great vessels or the great arteries, and they carry blood away from the ventricles of the heart. And let's, these are the two kind of um, great vesicle vessels of the heart. The pulmonary trunk comes around the right ventricle and it splits into right and left pulmonary arteries. And the aorta arises from your left ventricle and that carries blood to the rest of the body. But let's just pause there and look at a picture of the kind of surface anatomy of the heart. So before we kind of get any farther, I wanna to describe to you that your heart is made up of four chambers or four spaces. And the chambers on the top of the heart are called the atria or atrium for singular. And the chambers on the bottom of the heart are called the ventricles. So we have kind of these two pumps of your heart, but there's four chambers. There's two on the top, the atria, and two on the bottom. Those are called your ventricles. And again, rights and lefts sides of your heart are always named for how it would sit in a person's body itself. So not how you're looking at a patient, but how the patient, it would be the patient's right side of their heart. Also coming off of the body, we see kind of these sulcuses labeled. And again, a sulcus is just kind of a depression or um, kind of a boundary separating atria from ventricles, or here's the anterior um, interventricular sulcus. It's a little depression that kind of, you can't really tell but it's a little kind of depression that separates the ventricles. But within these sulcuses or sulci for plural, you'll see different um, coronary arteries and veins. So you'll see a great cardiac vein lie in the anterior interventricular sulcus. You'll have a right coronary artery in this coronary sulcus. Um, you see blood vessels going, kind of traveling on the surface of your heart because remember your heart is a muscle and itself your heart itself needs blood and oxygen to function. So that's why you have these coronary arteries, cardiac veins, bringing blood supply to the heart and then draining it because your heart itself needs oxygen to function. And where we get into problems like heart attacks is, is when one of these arteries that you see is blocked or there's a clot in one of these arteries. And if that occurs, if a part of your heart can't get the blood it needs for performing, you know, contraction and beating, then that part of the heart will die or become scar tissue. And that's what a heart attack is. When you're having a heart attack, you have blocked blood flow to an area of the heart and um, that heart, part of the heart tissue will die. Also coming off of the heart, we see a lot of different blood vessels. Um, we'll start with these two major ones coming um, off of the right atrium. The superior vena cava will drain blood into the right atrium from kind of the, your upper limbs and your head and neck region. And then the inferior vena cava drains blood from the lower half of the body um, back into the heart. And then you'll also see, um, and I'll show you a picture on the back side, but the left pulmonary veins 
uh, are these two red blood vessels on either side. They are red, even though they're called veins, because these pulmonary veins, right and left, are bringing oxygenated blood from your lungs back into the left atrium. And again, a posterior side of the heart will show that a little better. Uh, the pulmonary trunk shown here is in blue. It com is coming from your right ventricle. The pulmonary trunk will separate into uh, right and left pulmonary arteries, which take deoxygenated blood to the lungs to get oxygen. And then the aorta is this large red, um, it has an arch to it and then it goes down the backside of the heart. The aorta is the great blood vessel that takes blood from the left ventricle that's oxygenated and takes it to all parts of the body. So I know there's a lot of information going on here. Um, focus on just learning kind of what some of these blood vessels are called, first of all, um, and then we'll talk about the blood flow through your heart in general. If we look at a posterior view of the heart, we see what we call the coronary sinus, which is kind of this big kind of reservoir of venous blood that drains, um, all the veins of the heart will drain into the coronary sinus and the coronary sinus will drain all that deoxygenated blood back into your right atrium. So we're looking at the, the back side of the heart now. So we still have our four chambers with, again, the atrium are on the top, so left and right. And then the ventricles are on the bottom. So those are our four chambers of the heart that I'm putting in little squares. Uh, we see the superior and inferior vena cava are the blood vessels that bring blood back to your right atrium. Um, we see the left and right pulmonary arteries shown here, which are taking deoxygenated blood to the lungs to get oxygenated. The left and right pulmonary veins, which are these four, drain that oxygenated blood that's coming from the lungs back into the left atrium. Um, and then you see the big aorta, how it kind of curves, and then it'll eventually kind of go downward toward um, the lower half of the body. So this is just surface anatomy of the heart. There's a lot going on on the inside of the heart, but this gives you a little view of external anatomy of the heart. The heart chambers themselves, this is what I referred to before I kind of explained that picture. You have four heart chambers, the left atrium, the right atrium, which are the chambers on the top, and then the left ventricle and the right ventricle, which are the chambers on the bottom. And again, the coronary sulcus is the little depression that kind of separates. Um, it's just a little groove within the tissue of the heart that separates your atria from the ventricles. So the atria are the superior chambers. They are holding chambers for blood that's being drained into them. They're very small, they're thin walled, and they contract just a little bit to push blood um, into the ventricles, which are kind of sit right below them. And there's a wall between the two atria called the interatrial septum that separates the right from the left atria. Then the ventricles are the chambers on the bottom. And these are the big pumping chambers because remember the right side of the heart pumps the right side of the heart pumps blood to the lungs and the left side of the heart pumps blood to your body's tissues. So these chambers have thick, strong walls because they are just thick with cardiac muscle tissue to help pump and eject that blood. They contract very forcefully to propel blood out of the heart. And you have another septum called the interventricular septum, which is a wall that separates your right and left ventricles from each other. Then you have several valves throughout the heart and valves are very important for opening and closing to allow blood to flow through them to these specific chambers or blood vessels. And the valves um, just are, yeah, we'll talk about how important they are and when things go wrong with your valve, you might've heard of leaky valves. Um, we'll talk about why that is bad. But the valves between the atria and ventricles, and again, these are just pieces of tissue that open and close to allow blood to flow through them. So these are valves that will open to allow blood to go from the atria to the ventricles. And on the right side of the heart, we have your tricuspid valve. 
It's made of three cusps that kind of come together to close, and then they'll open to allow blood flow from the right atrius, the right ventricle. And the bicuspid valve, also known as your mitral valve, um, it, this has two cusps, so think of like two pieces of connective tissue come together and close. And this is the valve between the left atria and left ventricle. And they're called atrioventricular valves because they're between atria and ventricles. So you'll often see them abbreviated AV valves. Valvular control. So how do we control when your valves open and close? Well, you have little tiny cone-shaped muscular pillars in your ventricles called papillary muscles. And these muscles are attached by very strong connective tissue strings called chordae tendinae to the free margins of the cusps of those AV valves. So that when your ventricles contract, the papillary muscles contract and prevent your valves from opening into the atria by pulling on those chordae tendinae strings attached to the valve cusps. So what this means is when your ventricles contract and push out blood, the blood that leaves the ventricles does not go back in, up into the atria because there's a valve there that keeps it closed. Instead, when your ventricles contract, blood will exit the heart through either the pulmonary trunk or your aorta. So these valves are very important because if they do not close all the way, blood will go back into the atria and that will totally mess um, with blood pressure, contraction, and making sure your blood is getting to the places it needs to as efficiently as possible. So we have two atrioventricular valves between the atria and the ventricles, and then you have two what we call semilunar valves. Um, they have three half moon shaped cuffs. So that's where this semilunar word comes from. And they're valves between the pulmonary trunk um, and the aorta and the ventricles. So these valves will open um, when the ventricles actually contract and pump blood so that when they contract and open, blood will flow through these valves and then into the pulmonary trunk or into the aorta. So the pulmonary valve will open into the pulmonary trunk from your right ventricle and the aortic valve opens into the aorta from your left ventricle. And then this is a look at the internal anatomy of the heart. Um, and I, I hope you can take a moment just to realize how like amazing the heart is and how it can do all these things, even though there's a lot to learn about it. Um, I think, I don't know, I just think your heart is one of the coolest organs in your body because without it, we would die, but also it's just kind of this orchestrated event of contraction, relaxation to make sure blood flow occurs. So in the inside of the heart, let's first find our four chambers. So here's your right atrium, the right ventricle, and then the left atrium and the left ventricle. And again, these chambers on the top, you can see the atria are very thin walled because they contract just slightly to push blood down into the ventricles. And then you can see how the walls of your right and left ventricle are very thick because when they contract, they will forcefully push and kind of squeeze the blood um, out into your great vessels. But let's find these valves, first of all. So the tricuspid valve, this is your atrioventricular valve between the right atria and right ventricle. And it, you can kind of see them labeled in the left side, but the chordae tendinae are these white strings that are attached to papillary muscles. And the papillary muscles are these cone-shaped muscles on the walls of the ventricles. So there's your tricuspid valve on the right side of the heart and the bicuspid valve is on the left side of the heart. So those are your two atrioventricular valves. And then we have the semilunar valves. Your pulmonary semilunar valve opens when the right ventricle ejects blood into the pulmonary trunk. And then you have the aortic semilunar valve shown there at the opening to the aorta when your left ventricle pumps blood into your aorta. So those are kind of your four main valves. And again, if you've heard of um, a heart murmur or you know a valve prolapsing, and this is a lot more common than we might think. A lot of times people have problems with valves not closing all the way with their mitral valve. 
Um, it, anytime there's like a slight heart murmur, that means the valve doesn't close all the way, or a prolapse of the valve, that just means that the valve is not closing all the way, or a prolapse means it's kind of up to an area it shouldn't. And with that, you know, you disrupt the flow of the blood through the heart, which can lead to some pretty serious consequences if it's not caught early. Um, you can have valve surgery, you can get valves replaced with cadaver valves, animal valves, um, but you really want these valves to be working correctly um, in order that they're opening and closing at the right times. So this is a look at a cadaver heart. And you can kind of see the inside of the heart with some of these valves shown. It's always kind of fun to see, I think, what our hearts actually look like. I mean, our hearts are not nice red and blue, as you see here. But this is what our hearts look like. You can see the right and left ventricle, the thick muscular walls. And then you see kind of parts of these um, AV valves, the tricuspid valve on the right side and the bicuspid valve. And then you'll often see these heart valves labeled in a superior view, because if you're looking, if you kind of take a cross section of your heart and look down at it from the top, you see how all these valves are lined up as well, the bicuspid, tricuspid, and then your pulmonary and aortic semilunar valves. This shows you how bloods are, or valves are so important to control blood flow. So let's just say, um, your left ventricle is relaxed, so it's not contracting yet. So the bicuspid valve will be open as blood flows into the left ventricle, and your aortic valve will be closed. But as soon as your left ventricle contracts, that means it's going to squeeze or push the blood out of the left ventricle. So your aortic semilunar valve will open so that blood can flow and be ejected into your aorta. But during contraction, you want to make sure that this bicuspid valve between the left atrium and the left ventricle is closed so that when blood is ejected from the left ventricle, it's going out the aorta to all the tissues that need it, and it's not going back up into the left atrium. So this is why your valves are so important, because when your left ventricle contracts, you want that blood to go to your body's tissues that need oxygen. We just talked about if your brain tissues don't get oxygen, you'll die. If your muscles don't get oxygen, they can't perform. So if this valve doesn't work properly and blood goes back up into the atria instead of the aorta, your left ventricle has to work twice as hard to get that blood out to the tissues it needs to. And some tissues might not get the oxygen they need. So these little tiny valves are very important for ensuring that blood flows in the right direction that it should. The cardiac skeleton, and I'm just going to watch my time here. The cardiac skeleton, um, this is kind of a, what we call a plate, or um, it's just a very kind of strong piece of connective tissue. We call it the cardiac skeleton. It's made of fibers, but it consists of these rings of fibers that surround the, the valves, whether they're the AV valves or the semilunar valves to give them a very solid support. And this connective tissue also serves as an electrical insulation between atria and the ventricles to provide a very rigid attachment site for cardiac muscle. So I'm just gonna show you this cardiac skeleton. It's kind of this strong kind of fibrous kind of connected tissue that provides support to the valves um, as well as providing kind of an electrical insulation um, of your heart tissue. And we'll talk about why that's important. Your heart is constantly having electrical charges sent through it to make sure that the atria and ventricles are contracting when they should. And this electrical insulation is important so that, that those signals, those action potentials travel in the right pathway down the heart. And we'll get into a little bit about that and how we can figure out your electrical activity of the heart and why that is so important too. So this is a very important slide that will help you study blood flow through the heart. And I'd encourage you guys to just take a minute and study this slide. You can also use kind of this picture to help you learn blood flow through the heart. So here we have, we start with number one, blood flows into your right atrium via the superior and inferior vena cava. 
And this blood is deoxygenated because it's draining deoxygenated blood from all parts of the body. Blood will then go through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle, where the right ventricle contracts, ejects the blood through your pulmonary semilunar valve into the pulmonary trunk, and then out it splits into right and left pulmonary arteries, where number four is. Those right and left pulmonary arteries are still deoxygenated because they will take that deoxygenated blood to the lungs to pick up oxygen. When, that, when they pick up oxygen, that oxygen blood now returns via number five, via the, pul via the pulmonary veins. And that's why number five, these veins are in red because they're returning from the heart with oxygenated blood in them. They enter six, which is your left atrium. That oxygenated blood flows through your bicuspid valve into the left ventricle. And when your left ventricle contracts, it will eject that oxygenated blood through number eight, which is your aorta. That blood full of oxygen then goes to all parts of your body that need it. And you can kind of see the description down here of the specific blood vessels that it mentions. If you like to see the words kind of in a row, showing the blood flow through the heart, take a look at this slide. Um, but this is just a visual representation of blood flow through the heart. And I would encourage you to spend some time learning that too. Okay. So like we talked about before, your heart itself needs oxygen to function. And we run into problems when it doesn't get the oxygen it needs. So the coronary arteries supply blood to your heart wall, and they originate from the base of your aorta. So these are coming right off of your aorta, which is good because your aorta is what's carrying all the oxygen in your blood. The left coronary artery has three branches that go to the anterior heart wall and the left ventricle. The right coronary artery comes off of the right side of your aorta, and it supplies blood to your right ventricle. And then you have a series of cardiac veins which drain all the deoxygenated blood from the cardiac muscles. And they pretty much run parallel to coronary arteries. Most of them drain into the coronary sinus, which was that kind of blue reservoir that I showed you on the posterior side of the heart. And from the coronary sinus, that deoxygenated blood goes right back into the um, right atrium of the heart. So here we have blood supply to the heart in red are showing um, coronary arteries that are coming right off of the aorta uh, to bring oxygenated blood to your heart tissue so that it needs that oxygen to contract. And then you see the drainage system of the heart. All of the veins drain into this coronary sinus on the posterior side. And that brings the deoxygenated blood right back into the right atrium. And again, we run into problems many times this anterior interventricular artery can get blocked. And it's the one that supplies blood to your left ventricle. And not saying that the left ventricle is more important than your right ventricle, but the left ventricle is what pumps blood through the aorta to your body's tissues with oxygen. So if we have a blockage in this artery, somewhere in your left ventricle might not function as properly. Um, because that part of the blood, that part of the heart will die, and that is what causes a heart attack. Um, if there's an extreme blockage, you might, you know, lose that part of the heart tissue altogether. The heart could stop beating. When you hear of the word bypass surgery, what they're doing is they're taking a piece of blood vessel from another part of the, the body. So let's say you have a blockage right here in the blood vessel and they're putting another piece of artery, kind of they're making a bypass. They're bypassing that blockage in one of your coronary arteries. You might've heard of someone with triple bypass surgery. That means they do this three times. There's three blockages in some of these arteries and they're performing like an artery graft where they add a kind of a different pathway for that blood to take around the blockage. Here's your heart wall. The epicardium is the surface of the heart. Uh, the myocardium, myo means muscle. So this is the thick middle layer composed of cardiac muscle. You can see that that's the biggest layer here. And then the endocardium is the smooth inner surface of the heart wall itself.
cardiac muscle, we talked a little bit when we went through histology and muscle tissue earlier in the semester, but cardiac muscle is very unique in that it, each kind of cell has a nucleus that's in the center. The cells branch, they have a lot of mitochondria and they're striated, meaning they have actin and myosin, and they have a lot of calcium and ATP that are required for contractions, They'll also, you'll also see what we call intercalated discs in cardiac muscle cells, and that makes sure that your cells are communicating um, in order to contract as a unit when your heart beats and ejects that blood. So that's cardiac muscle tissue. Cardiac muscle action potentials. So we haven't finished talking about action potentials yet, but hopefully by now, you understand that when we say action potential, that just means we're electrically stimulating a nerve. Well, your cardiac muscle gets electrically stimulated as well in order to cause it to contract, to squeeze the blood out. And it changes in membrane channels permeability to different ions are resp they're responsible for producing this action potential or electrical signal. And we cause, call it the pacemaker potential. And the word pacemaker comes up several times as we talk about the electrical kind of control of the heart. The depolarization phase is like the depolarization phase kind of in other action potentials and that sodium channels will open. In your cardiac muscle tissue, calcium channels also open. And then instead of coming right back down into a depolarization phase, we kind of plateau off a little bit so that your action potential kind of goes up and then it plateaus, during which time sodium channels co close, potassium channels open, and calcium channels remain open before going back into our repolarization phase when potassium channels open and then these calcium channels close. So the cardiac muscle action potential, instead of looking like a nice kind of peak, it peaks up and then it plateaus and then it goes down. And that's due to these extra calcium channels that remain open. So this plateau phase will prolong an action potential. So make it kind of last longer um, by keeping the calcium channels open. In skeletal muscle, for example, action potentials take two milliseconds. Remember that graph, it just goes up and down. Whereas in cardiac muscle, because we have this plateau stage, they last a little bit longer. So this just kind of reminds you of what the action potential looks like in skeletal muscle. Remember, we had just a depolarization phase and a repolarization phase. But in your heart muscle tissue, we have this plateau phase, in which case we just have this extra calcium channel that remains open. So the action potential just lasts longer in cardiac muscle tissue. The conduction system of the heart. So this is really important for describing how we can control how electricity moves through the heart. And it needs to move through the heart in a very kind of orchestrated way, because remember your heart muscles, your cardiac muscle will not contract until it gets stimulated by an electrical impulse. So we want our ventricles to contract at the same time. You want your atria to contract at the same time. And that's all due to the conduction system of the heart, this electrical activity that flows through it. If we have a problem with your electrical activity of the heart, that can lead to problems like atrial fibrillation, um, also could lead to a heart attack. It could lead to heart failure if it's not getting any sort of electrical activity taken to it. But the contraction of your atria and ventricles, it's coordinated by specialized cardiac muscle cells that form the conduction system of the heart. And all of these cells can produce spontaneous action potentials. What this means is that your heart produces its own action potentials, not forever. So if we were to remove my heart from the body right now, it would continue beating and, and, and kind of firing off action potentials and electrical signals. Again, not forever because it wouldn't have any source of blood supply to it. But um, this conduction system, the ability of your heart to produce its own electrical signals um, gives it the name of like a pacemaker because it can set its own heart rate and heartbeat. 
And these are the kind of structures within the conduction system. We have a sinoatrial node, atrioventricular node, atrioventricular bundle, right and left bundle branches, and then Purkinje fibers. I'll describe what each of these like structures are in the conduction system, and then I'll show you a picture where they're located and how the electrical activity flows through them and through the heart. So your sinoatrial node, also known as your SA node, is in your right atrium. And this is where the action potential starts or your electrical signal starts to control all the electrical activity of your heart. So we often call your SA node the pacemaker of the heart because it will control the pace of the heartbeat. It has a large number of calcium channels in it. The atrial ventricular node or AV node is located in the lower portion of your right atrium and it will, it will receive action potentials from the SA node and it will be sent down to this AV node. In the atrioventricular node, it's a little special in that it kind of slows action potentials down as they pass through it. And this slow rate allows the atria to completely finish contracting to empty the blood into your ventricles before the action potential flows to your ventricles. So the AV node kind of slows um, the action potentials down as they go through it. Then the action potentials go from your AV node to the AV bundle, which divides into left and right bundle branches, which will eventually go into Purkinje fibers. And the Purkinje fibers are what will pass to the apex or the bottom tip of the heart, and then up into all of the cardiac muscle of your ventricle walls. Um, through the Purkinje fibers, these action potentials are rapidly delivered to all cardiac muscles at the same time so that your ventricles can contract as a unit. So here's the order of an action potential through the, this electrical conduction activity of the heart, starting with the SA node going to the AV node, again, where it kind of slows it down a little bit, just so that all the blood can finish entering your ventricles, because once the action potential goes into the AV bundle, the right and left bundle branches and the Purkinje fibers, your ventricles will quickly contract to eject all that blood that has flowed into them. So here we have the conduction system of the heart starting kind of in the upper roof of your right atrium. The SA node sets the pace for these action potentials, so we call it the pacemaker. Then it will travel to your AV node, the action potentials or this electrical signal. At the AV node, again, it slows it down a little bit before heading into the AV bundle, into the right and left bundle branches, and then into the Purkinje fibers, which travel up, down to the apex, and then up into all the cardiac muscle cells of the ventricular walls. So now we're going to get into an EKG and why EKGs are important. So you've probably seen on doctor shows, I don't, what are the is Grace Anatomy still even going on? I don't even know what the popular doctor shows are out right now, but you always see them hooked up to an EKG. And I shouldn't even talk about shows because you guys are all medical, you have a lot of you are EMTs already. Um, so the EKG monitors this electrical activity of the heart. And it's what you see as the little blips on the screen showing these kind of depolarization events or the action potentials as they travel through. Um, EKGs, also known as ECGs, they're called electrocardiograms. Um, in German, cardio is with a K, so that's why we sometimes call it an EKG. They record the electrical events of the heart, and they are very important in diagnosing any cardiac abnormality. You could hook up the baby in the womb when the mom is in labor to an EKG to see what the baby's heart rate is like. Um, but they're just super important. They've been around for many years, but if someone comes into your ER and they're complaining of, you know, left side pain, heart pain, feels like an elephant sitting on their chest, those are telltale signs of an EKG and they will um, hook them up to see the electrical activity as it flows through the heart. EKGs are used by placing electrodes and leads throughout the body because these electrodes can pick up kind of the electrical activity that's coming from the heart, but from your skin cells. So they'll often hook you up to several leads or electrodes throughout the body. 
and they contain a P wave, a QRS complex, and a T wave. And we'll go over them really simply, but the P wave um, will stand for when the atria depolarize. And remember the word depolarize, that just means that, that means that an action potential is traveling through them. The QRS complex means the ventricles are depolarizing. And then the T wave stands for the repolarizing of the ventricles are going back to normal. And this is kind of very consistent with what one like heartbeat would look like. The P wave, this would be when your atria depolarize. So right after you see this P wave, um, your atria will contract because they've given that electrical action potential. The QRS complex stands for when your ventricles depolarize. So soon after this, your ventricles will contract. And then the T wave stands for when your ventricles relax again. So this is one heartbeat. Atria contract with a P wave, ventricles contract right after the QRS complex. So this is one heartbeat. Atria contract, ventricles contract. And this EKG will repeat over and over again as your heart continues to beat with each cycle and each heartbeat. Different things in the EKG can show different problems. These, these little squares are 0.4 milliseconds long in time. So what EKG technicians do is they will kind of calculate out the average time for an electrical wave to go from your atria to the ventricles. If there's any blockage or delay in that time, if this distance between the P wave and the QRS complex is any longer than it should, it's called the PR interval, that could mean that there's a blockage in that node. Um, sometimes the QRS complex can be inverted. Sometimes your ECG looks like a toddler scribbling lines up and down. That's usually atrial ventriculation, ventricular or ventricular fibrillation, which is not good either. So even like even minor change, you know, even minor um, issues with an ECG can be a really helpful diagnostic tool. Because again, the electrical activity of the heart, which is what you're looking at in an ECG, controls when the ventricles contract. So if there's a delay in ventriculars, ventricles contracting. Sometimes you won't even see the QRS complex, which means your ventricles don't contract for that heartbeat. Um, it just, it's a very good diagnostic tool to help with diagnosing problems for anyone who comes in. With that, we kind of jump into the cardiac cycle. And what I might do is I think I'm gonna stop here instead of kind of pushing through. We technically have two days to get through this. So I think I'm going to stop the recording here because your brains might be fried already from all of this information on the